أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب إله العالمين بالقاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابهم مجيد يا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعرفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم صدق الله العلي العظيم Islam has a very universal approach to society and to people and enforces this concept of unity. When we look in the verse of Surah Hujarat where Allah is talking about, O mankind, I have created you from man and woman and made you into families and tribes so that you may know one another and that the best amongst you is the one who is most pious. This verse talks about how Allah didn't give superiority to tribes, didn't give superiority to races, didn't give superiority to colors, but rather these were simply resources for us to be familiar with one another and that superiority in humanity is determined by piety. Meaning what? Allah is taking away all of these barriers that we create amongst ourselves that give us superiority over each other. Sometimes we say, I am Arab and non-Arab. Sometimes we make the example of, I am American and I am foreigner or Pakistani. Sometimes we make the example that I am European and another one is African. And we try to establish some kind of superiority on these fundamentals. And one of the most basic processes through which we try to establish superiority over one another is, well, I'm a man. Therefore, I have superiority. Or my role in Islam is more significant than the role of a woman. However, we see that Allah is introducing that this isn't the case. Islam doesn't believe in providing superiority to one over the other. For example, when we take a look in the Quran and we look at Surah Ahzab verse 35, we see that Allah is making the specification to go through and explain where He goes through and He discusses whether you're a Muslim man or a Muslim woman, whether you're a Mu'min man or a Mu'min woman. And Allah continues with these descriptions to say that if you tried to differentiate between male and female on any one of these levels in obedience to Allah, there is no difference between them that they both attain the same level and they can attain great reward with Allah regardless of whether you're a male or female. And this is where we have a conversation that does Islam promote the superiority of a man over a woman? When you strip back everything else, strip back all of the rhetoric, strip back all of the cultures and everything and look at Islam purely, you'll see that when Allah makes a commitment in the Qur'an that I have not given you superiority of one over the other except in the cases of piety, where your acts of worship are what make you superior over any other being, He's taking away that male and female superiority. Let's go even more basic. Let's take a look at it in the fundamental to say that when you take a look at it, are the usul ad deen are the principles of the faith different for man or woman? If Islam believed in differences and believed in non-equality between men and women, wouldn't the principles of your faith be different depending on whether you're a man or a woman? But our Lord is the same, our Anbiya are the same, our Aymah are the same, and our Day of Judgment is the same. Therefore, the reward and the punishment is the same. When you take a look at, for example, even through the actions or the, the faru and the branches of faith, you see that in the actions of religion, the, Islam is the same, so therefore the Salat is the same, the fasting is the same, the Hajj is the same, the Zakat is the same, the Khums is the same, everything is the same. However, there is one point that we see a difference in when we take a look at Jihad. When we take a look at, for example, the role of holy war and the physical manifestation of external or Jihad al-Asghar, of how it's treated in Islam and it becomes an obligation on the men but not on the women. But the question is, is this a differentiation in equality or is this a differentiation in roles? Now, while we may see equality within searching for, for example, uh, what are our responsibilities in terms of faith and action, there are some differences when it comes to how we execute and how we complete our responsibilities. And this is where equality and justice become the conversation. There's equality in reward, there's equality in punishment, but when it comes to executing your obligations, here Allah brings justice into it. 
There's a classic example that comes in, in, in contemporary thought processes that if you take a monkey, a giraffe, an elephant, and a dolphin and you give them a test and the test is to climb a tree and you say that we are processing with equality all of these different ones will have the same exact test that they have to climb the same tree. Well, that test is appropriate for a monkey to see if a monkey can climb a tree, but it's illogical to assume that a dolphin could climb a tree, or a giraffe would climb a tree, or an elephant would climb a tree. That kind of equality is not the kind of equality that Islam believes in. Rather, that's where justice comes in. That it's just to test one individual with a particular exam and just to test another individual with a different type of exam. The examination that we take a look at in life is the different roles that men and women play in support of Islam. Where we may see that, for example, men have the responsibility to be present on the battlefield in the support of Islam. Women may not have that obligation to be present in the battlefield, but they play just as significant a role in the support of Islam as men. Where do we see this example best played out? We can take a look at this example when we take a look at the differences in the circumstance and situation and the impact of the women in Karbala and the impact of the women in the event of Kufa with Muslim Ibn Aqib. These two examples will give us the impact that women have in the support of Islam and demonstrate to us the good characteristics and qualities that we want to establish within the responsibilities that our women have in the support of Islam and how that impacts Islam as a whole and how we can see the bad examples that if we try to give women and not teach women the importance and the significance of their role in how to support Islam, how someday this could be a problem for us. And you and I today, this becomes a very relevant conversation. Why? You and I today are waiting for the dhuhr of the master of our time, Sahib al-Asr wa-Zaman, Ajjal Allahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. When he comes, it may be that again that the men are called to the battlefield. And it may be that we have the obligation to go and support our Imam with the use of weapons, with the use of our lives, with the use of our strength. But that doesn't mean that the role of the women will not exist at this time, that women will be insignificant, that they have no responsibilities, that they have no obligations. No, as a matter of fact, we need to be preparing this concept now to understand that there is significance and importance in how women execute their responsibilities to Islam so that they can just as equally earn the same rewards as the men can on the battlefield. And, and this is how we establish it, by taking a look and learning the lessons through what we see in the history of Islam. Now, when we take a look at the events of Kufa, we see that when Hazrat Muslim ibn Aqil enters the city of Kufa and establishes his position as the Safir of our Imam, Imam al Hussein, he has the support of approximately 18,000 men in the city of Kufa to come and establish the authority of Imam al Hussein in Kufa. And these 18,000 men, they come and they pledge their allegiance to Hazrat Muslim ibn Aqil. And Hazrat Muslim ibn Aqil then starts the process of preparing to figure out how it is that he will establish the position of Imam Hussein in the city of Kufa. We see that as these events unfold and challenges come to arise, how he loses his support. The significant example we're told is, is that when Hazrat Muslim ibn Aqil begins to lead prayers with 18,000 men behind them at the beginning of Salat al-Maghrib, by the time he finished Salat al-Isha, there's no one there. How does that happen? How does an army of 18,000 men dissipate suddenly? Well, this is where we take a look at the role of women. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad was a very treacherous man, although a very intelligent man at the same time. When he enters into Kufa and he sees the support that Hazrat Muslim has, he has to figure out a way to compensate for it and to break that support. Ubaidullah at that time has really no support in the city of Kufa for him. He has a small number of police force that are there to support him, not much more than that. So what does he do? When he sees the army of Hazrat Muslim gathering, he doesn't come and bring a confrontation against the men. Rather, he sends his representatives, he sends his policemen, he says, I want you to go out to each of the mahalla, the, the the communities where these men live and put a flag there 
And then I want you to call out and let the people know. Now remember, all of the men are in front of the governor's palace. So who's left at home? The women. Ubaidullah says, in front, in, in these communities, when you stand there with the flag, I want you to call out and announce that Yazid ibn Muawiyah, the Khalifa of the time, is sending an army from Syria. And when that army comes here, all of those who have challenged and opposed the authority of the true Khalifa will be dealt with in the way that they deserve and they will be killed. Except those who right now come and take security under the banner and the flag of the Khalifa of our time. Anyone who comes and seeks security under this banner that we have placed here at this time will not be persecuted and will not be attacked and will not be subject to punishment for their uprisal against the true Khalifa of the time. Now, the men aren't there to hear this, but the women are. And the women hearing this at the potential that they could lose their houses, that they could be attacked by the army, that their husbands could be killed, their brothers could be killed, their sons could be killed, their fathers could be killed. They become anxious. And they come to the gates of the governor's palace where all of the men are gathered and they look for their brothers, their sons, their fathers, their husbands and they tell them, Muslim has many supporters. Don't risk your life for this. There's an army coming from Syria and it's possible that when that army comes it'll wipe out this whole army and the whole uprising and you'll be no more. He has many supporters. Let the others take this responsibility. You come home. The Khalifa is promising that anyone who leaves right now will not be punished for what they've done thus far. Come home. And one by one the women come. And in the beginning, the excuse is given, Muslim has many supporters. Come home. Let the others deal with this. It's not your problem. And as people start to leave slowly and slowly and surely and slowly, eventually there comes a point in time when now when the women come, instead of saying, Muslim has many supporters, he doesn't need you here, they start saying, Muslim doesn't have enough supporters. You're going to get killed. Come home. You're going to get killed. Don't throw away your life. Come home. And slowly but surely they ebb away at the confidence of these men who had just sworn allegiance to Aba Abdullah, that they would be the supporters of Aba Abdullah, their fear that's initiated in them, who will take care of us if you die? Don't waste your life, come home. These conversations frighten the men. And we see that over a short period of time, so many thousands of supporters turn into after Salat al-Isha, not a single supporter. Muslim ibn Aqil is left alone in the city of Kufa. This is an example of showing that if our women and our children aren't raised to have faith in Allah, that Allah is the true provider and that we sacrifice everything and our priorities are Allah and supporting the religion of Allah, that they'll break the supports. They won't give us the support that we need when things become difficult. There is no normal person who is not a soldier who when he is given or shown the opportunity or the responsibility that he has to support Islam, he doesn't have fear. We all have obligations. The question is, come tomorrow, when it comes time to support the Imam of our time, and he puts out the call and the caller calls out that Al-Qa'im has risen, come to the support of your Imam. What is your family going to say to you? Are they going to say, go, go, go support the Imam? Or are they going to come to us and they say, hey, who's going to pay the mortgage if you go? How will we take care of the children if you go? What's going to become of me if you go? How will I take care of these things? It's already going to be a difficult situation, but in that case, is your family your support system? Or are they pulling away your legs? Now, if you want to see the counterbalance and see the ideal example of where we need to go, look at the field of Karbala on the 10th of Ashura. Look at the example of the mothers the night before who are preparing their children to go and make their sacrifices. Look at the example of for ex Habib ibn Mawahir. Habib ibn Mawahir is in the city of Kufa when the letter of Aba Abdullah comes to him. And Aba Abdullah says, Oh Habib, you are my old friend, I need your assistance. 
Habib that night begins his contemplation much the same way you or I would make our contemplation if we were called to war for our Imam. He sits down with his wife to have a conversation. He says to her, I received a letter from my Imam. He's requested my assistance in the battlefield. He's in a state of difficulty. Do you think I should go? If I go, who will take care of you? What will happen to you? Habib's wife gives him a lovely example. She says, you're worried about me. You stay here. I'll go to the support of the Imam. You stay here. I'll go. Imagine that sense of where Habib has a legitimate concern the same way you or I would, right? Our responsibility has been to take care of our families, to ensure that we provide for them, that we take care of them. Now all of a sudden we see a risk where we may not be there to support our families and to take care of them. What happens in this case? If our women don't give us that support, how would we go out and we support the Imam of the time? If our families don't give us that support, how do we go out and we perform these actions? Look further in the role of Karbala and you see the importance and the significance of the upbringing and the responsibility and the value that women have in the support of the Ahlul Bayt and how significant their role is. That you see these 72 companions and this, these family members who are now the supporters and the only protectors of Aba Abdullah, how they go out and they fight and they sacrifice themselves for Aba Abdullah. How it is those, those women who become the ones, the backbone that give the confidence to the extent where the enemies fear these 72 men. Imagine you have an army of thousands and you can't control 72 men. How does that happen? It's because they have that confidence that this is the action I need to complete in support of my Imam. They have that confidence that this is my obligation. They know that I have nothing else to worry about except my Imam. And that comes from the family and how the family supports. Let's look at the example of Wahb al-Kalbi, who was a Christian man who happened to be passing the area of Karbala with his wife and his mother. He was a newlywed. When he saw the condition of Aba Abdullah, he wanted to help them, so he sat with his wife and his mother and he said, what's your opinion? Should we support Aba Abdullah or not? His wife replied to him, she said, Wahab, leave them be. We have no business with them. This isn't our responsibility. Let's go from here. Wahab's mother who was there, who was a more a mature woman who knew the important priorities in life, turns to him and he says, don't listen to your wife. Go and support Aba Abdullah. And Wahab takes the advice of his mother and joins the army of Aba Abdullah. They say when this Wahab went to battle, he was a fierce warrior and he was known for having a broad chest and it was one of the ones who was a fierce warrior in the battle. When he enters the battlefield and he begins to fight, at one instance two of his fingers become severed from an attack of a sword. And in that moment, after he finishes off his opponent, he comes back towards the tents of Aba Abdullah. As he comes back to the tents of Aba Abdullah, he sees his wife there and his wife comes running towards him. She says, why did you come back to me alive? Why have you come back alive? Why did you not sacrifice yourself for Aba Abdullah? Why are you here? Wahab looks at his wife and he says, I'm astounded by your condition. A little while ago, weren't you the one who was telling me that this isn't our problem, that we shouldn't be here? Now when I am fight, fighting gallantry, gallantly in the battlefield and I've come back because of an injury simply to wrap my fingers, I have not finished my fight. My life is still in sacrifice for Aba Abdullah. But tell me wife, what has changed in you that now all of a sudden you want me to go sacrifice myself when before you weren't satisfied with my fighting for Aba Abdullah? She says, that was before I saw how alone Aba Abdullah had become in this world. That was before I realized that there was none to support Aba Abdullah. If I would have realized that from the beginning, I would have never ever questioned the ability to support Aba Abdullah. Wahab being pleased with the support of his wife returns to the battlefield and he fights gallantly until he attains martyrdom. They say when he attained martyrdom, they took the head of Wahab and they threw it back at the tents. And it is mother who receives the head and she says, if I had more to give, I would have given more. They say the mother of Wahab then picks up the peg of the tent and goes and attacks the enemies of Aba Abdullah. It says, if I have permission, then I will fight for Aba Abdullah if I have no more sons to give. 
and then she is commanded by Aba Abdullah to return to the tent. Look at the strength and the support and the significance of the support of the women and how they make it possible to go for the support of Aba Abdullah. Look at the example of Qasim ibn al-Hasan, who when he wants to go fight for the Imam, he worries first of whether his mother would give him permission and rather his mother is the one who is saying, Qasim, your father is not here. I have no more sacrifices than you to give. Go and fight for your uncle. Go, it is your responsibility to be our representative on this day. You are your father's representative. How is it that when Qasim is turned away by Aba Abdullah, when Qasim is looked at by Aba Abdullah, he says, you are the young child of my brother. You are the memory of my brother Al-Hasan. How can I send you to the battlefield? And Qasim begins to become disheartened. It is his mother who gives him confidence. It is his mother not who takes away his confidence and says, it's okay, my son, don't go. But rather she goes, no, and you must beg your uncle for permission. You are your father's son. How can it be that your uncle is in difficulty and you are not there to support him? We see that in this case, Qasim is given the support and that confidence by his mother to go back and continue to plead for permission plead for permission. When Aba Abdullah turns to him and he says, okay, maybe you need your mother's permission. Maybe she would not be pleased. He says, oh my Imam, it is my mother who keeps sending me to ask your permission to go to the battlefield. Remember the youth of Qasim. How is it possible for a child of 14 years to have such a desire if, not, if it was not taught to him by his mother and his household to go in support of the Imam? When you look at the Maqtal of Karbala, you see many things in the Maqtal of Karbala, but one thing that you see which is unique is that there is a description of the dress of Qasim in the field of Karbala. That there is a description that describes when Qasim enters the battlefield, he is dressed in a shirt and he is wearing sandals. Why? All of the other soldiers who enter the battlefield, they came with armor. One narrator, he writes, he says, the reason we include the description of the dress of Qasim in the battlefield is that Qasim did not fight war. Rather, there was dhulm and injustice done against Qasim. He was too young to be able to fit into the armor, so he went to the field without any armor. When you hear the narrations of the trampling of Qasim and why his body came apart when he was attacked, it's because there was no armor to protect him. He was that young child who was so innocent that when he stood before the army and he knew these enemies are thirsty for his blood, he still stooped down to fix a broken sandal without worrying that an enemy would attack him in this instance. And this is how the Shahadat of Qasim comes. How does a child so young, not who doesn't know enough that the enemy would attack him if he fixes his shoe, enter into a battlefield if it is not with the support of his mother and the support of the women in Islam that teach us this lesson. We have the obligation, whether we be the men of Islam or we be the women of Islam, that we fulfill our responsibilities and learn our, what our roles are in supporting the Imam. If our job is not to be on the battlefield, on the front lines, it does not mean we have no obligation in support of the Ahlul Bayt and the support of the religion of Allah. But rather we have to understand and have ma'rifah of what is our role in the support of Islam.